As bananas ruled the world and pear kind was on the brink of extinction, one brave pear, a hero named Fruitius Maximus, jumped back in time using his homemade time machine to rewrite history and save everyone. During his travels, he met up with famous detective Pear Fessor Layton and set about taking down the Banana Empire piece by piece. With the help of powerful allies such as Plums, Monkeys, Long Boys and Big Boys, Fruitius and his crew completed Creature Stage and embarked into Tribal Stage with the help of a Pear Sympathizer named Bananakin Skywalker. Having found that the Banana Empire went much, much deeper than Fruitius ever imagined, he was hopeful of seeking help from his old friends, the Brown Village. But to his unmitigated horror, he found they had been taken over by none other than the Bananas themselves. In a state of shock, Fruitius decided he couldn't tell the rest of the tribe. It would break their spirits. They were busy befriending and taming the local population of melons, but Fruitius had to save the Brown Village. For all he knew, they could be being held hostage. How was he going to do this all by himself? He had no idea. Then, when all seemed hopeless, something completely unexpected happened. On the horizon, Fruitius spotted the giant silhouette of a human man. It was an epic Eren Jaeger, and it wasn't at all far away from the Brown Villager's base. Fruitius came up with a genius but dangerous plan. If he could free the Brown Village though, he was willing to risk it all. And without further ado, he set out alone, directly towards the epic Eren Jaeger. His plan was to draw Eren Jaeger's attention towards himself. Then he would kite Eren towards the Brown Village and have him do the dirty work instead. It took a few tries because, as it turned out, Eren Jaeger was a little bit afraid of crowded spaces. But after kiting him towards the bananas again and again, he eventually took the bait. And, while the banana chieftain chased Eren away, Fruitius began to attack the village. Within a second, the banana chief had returned, and Fruitius' plan was in tatters. But hearing the distant cries of warfare, the rest of the pairs appeared as backup, and an all-out battle commenced. Eren Jaeger continued to wreak havoc in the background, but it seemed that Fruitius had underestimated his comrades. They were in this together after all, and with an almighty team effort, and despite fighting the banana's best soldier, Farmer Bobbins, they brung the brown village to its knees. Unfortunately though, there was still no sign of the original Brown Village, and with a bunch of wild mutated plums attempting to steal their food, the pairs headed back to base empty mittened. Fruitius had not yet given up hope that the original Brown Village was still out there, and with this, he set about scouting out the other tribes in the area. There was the Green Village, who were a bunch of bananas, the Scion Village, who were a bunch of bananas, and the Pink Village, who were being attacked by another epic. This time, it was the Cart Titan. This was perfect. Fruitius could employ the same technique he had just used. Attacking the Pink Village base would be easy if they were distracted by the Cart Titan. What? As if by magic, it seemed the Cart Titan had vanished into thin air. Well, there goes that plan, thought Fruitius. It seemed he would be relying on Eren Jaeger once again. He chose the Scion Village as his next targets, once again kiting Eren Jaeger over towards their base. All was going well, but just as Eren Jaeger was about to lay waste to the Scion Village, the Pink Village, having scared away the Cart Titan, began to attack the other pairs. Fruitius rushed back just in time. The Pink Village were no match for the pairs' combined attacks, and even Bananakin Skywalker helped out to defend their home. The Pink Village were repelled for now. Not wanting to be attacked by everyone around them, Fruitius and the tribe decided to change tactics. They needed to make at least some allies, and with this in mind, they equipped themselves with didgeridoos. Now, the only question was, who did they try and befriend? And then, the answer presented itself. The Green Village had walked past, and began fishing in a spot nearby. This was curiously peaceful behaviour for a bunch of bananas, and the pairs decided to take a chance and put on a concert for them. Seeing as the pairs weren't allowed any money by the Banana Empire, they could only play royalty-free music. But luckily, everyone loves Kevin MacLeod songs, and they managed to win the Green Villagers Fisherman over by playing one of his greatest pieces, a song called Meatball Parade. It took a little while, as the fisherman seemed to have an obsession with maracas, but once he came around on the didgeridoos, he informed Fruit of some wonderful news. The Green Village were housing refugees of the original Brown Village, and although the Brown Village's chieftain had sacrificed himself to save the others, the rest were safe. 
Frutius wanted to know more, but the conversation was cut short by an attack from the Cyan village, who were still mad that Frutius had brought Eren Jaeger towards their base. The assault was tough, and the pairs were on the back foot, but just in time, the Green Village arrived with gifts from the Brown Village refugees. Even in their darkest hour, it seemed the Brown Village was still the nicest village in the world, and because of this, the pairs were able to withstand the Cyan Village's attack. To solidify their relationship with the Green Village, the pairs decided to put on another concert, this time with the addition of the fishermen's favourite instrument, the Maracas. It was a great success, and the celebrations went on long into the night. This gave Frutius an idea. Another distraction tactic, which didn't involve quite as much risk. He called it Operation Didgeridont. His plan was to pretend to befriend the Cyan Village by giving them a gift and holding them a concert, and as they enjoyed the music, the rest of the pairs would attack from behind. Putting the plan into action, Frutius and his understudy, a pair named Obi-Wan Pear Nobi, turned up at the Cyan Village and began to play their instruments. Meanwhile, the rest of the tribe snuck around the back of the village, and at the opportune moment, they struck. The battle was over in seconds, the bananas were caught completely unaware, and the pears were victorious. But it seemed it wasn't just Frutius who had been thinking strategically, and when they returned home, they found the pink village had been attacking while they were away. Bananakin Skywalker had been bravely holding the fort, but as the pears returned to deal with the pink invaders, he suffered a whole load of damage, and with fighting happening all over the place, he was regrettably caught in the crossfire. Bananakin was dead. The pink village would have to pay for what they had done. Bananakin was such a brave soul, who had sacrificed so much to help those in a lesser situation than his own. Frutius knew what must be done. Operation Didgeridont 2.0 While preparing for this operation, a new village turned up in the area. It was a tribe of melons. Perfect, another ally to get on side. But that would have to wait as the Pink Village were advancing at a fast pace, and had already created a hover car which they were using to abduct native pairs. With their didgeridoos in hand, Frutius and Obi-Wan Pear Nobi began to perform in front of the Pink Village, and as they were distracted, the tribe once again snuck round the back. The attack was just as effective as the first time. They took out the town hall in several swift and coordinated motions, and the Pink Village was no more. Now that that was over, the pairs could make friends with the Tribe of Melons. They decided to play Kevin MacLeod's most prestigious song, Who Likes to Party, to really impress their future allies. But as the concert was going on, Eren Jaeger turned up and began attacking the band. Before they could finish, Eren had taken out so many band members that they couldn't continue the song. The Melons saw this and decided to help out. With a tag team of the remaining pairs and the sheer might of the Melon army, both fruits together were able to defeat arguably the most powerful creature in all the world. And after a quick recuperation, the pairs finished their concert and prepared to advance into civilization stage. But just before they could, the Melons told them something vitally important. Bananas weren't inherently evil. Frutius had been wondering about this for some time. Although some of the bananas he'd come across were pretty nasty, some of them, such as Bananakin Skywalker and the Green Village, were actually quite nice. No, 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 said all the melons simultaneously. The bananas are simply being used. The real ones to watch out for is the Yellow Nation. In Frutius' previous timeline, the Yellow Nation had been a species of pears very closely related to bananas. And heeding the melon's advice, Frutius and the team advanced to civilization stage with the utmost caution. If Frutius was going to have to infiltrate the Yellow Nation, he was taking no chances. And as such, he and the pairs decided to make themselves vehicles to drive in the shape of bananas to act as a form of camouflage. Upon establishing a capital city, Buenos Peris, the immediate goal was to collect spice. In civilization stage, spice is the main form of currency, specifically Chinese five spice. The pear nation would need a lot of this if they were going to convert the whole world back into the Church of the Holy Fruit Bowl. And when they gathered up enough of it, they began to religiously convert every nation in Buenos Peris' immediate vicinity. The Crimson Nation and the Orange Nation were quickly persuaded. But then came an ominous phone call. The Yellow Nation had made contact. Frutius was so unprepared that he hung up on them immediately. 
If they were going to defeat the Yellow Nation from the inside, they would need to appear as unthreatening as possible, so as to not raise any suspicion. To do this, they made boats in the shape of bananas as well, and set out to perform a tactic that Fruitius called the Trojan Banana. They would sail to the Yellow Nation and attempt to get inside the city by offering the banana boats as gifts. But there was one thing that could give them away. Pairs couldn't drive boats very well as they were wearing mittens, which meant they had zero dexterity of their fingers. What's more, once they found the Yellow City, their arms were so short that they couldn't reach it. Fruitius was so frustrated by this that he had to religiously convert the Red Nation just to calm down. But as he moved to convert the Pink Nation as well, something brightened his spirits. A call from some old friends. The Forest Nation of Pairs were offering to set up a trade route together. With the Forest Nation's backing, the Pairs were able to convert the Pink and Blue Nation, and now finally, they could move on to the... <gasps> oh dear! The Yellow Nation were attacking the Brown City, a city set up by the Green Tribe through their coalition with the Brown Village refugees. As many banana boats as possible attempted to head over to the scene, but they were so bad at driving that by the time they received the Brown Nation's call for help, it was too late. The Yellow Nation had taken over. If Fruitius wanted to liberate the Brown Nation, then now was as good a time as any to perform Operation Trojan Banana 2.0. But as one brave banana car tried to stealth into the city, they were spotted and blown up in an instant. Even with several banana cars, the operation was not a success, and it was here that Fruitius realised that attacking over land and sea would not be enough. They would have to improve on their predecessor's previous invention, the Pairlocopter. And with this, Fruitius invented the Pairplane. Assembling an army of Pairplanes would take a long time, and as Buenos Perries worked their hardest, the Yellow Nation took their opportunity and conquered city after city. Even the Forest Nation weren't safe. But as the fleet of pair planes grew, they practiced piloting even despite their short arms and mittens, and Fruitius promised himself that he and the other flyers would liberate everyone. Meanwhile, more and more cities fell, and eventually, the Yellow Nation had conquered half of the world. Finally though, the Royal Pair Force, which is the pair equivalent of the Royal Air Force, was ready, and the pair planes were more powerful than anybody could have anticipated. They swept across the skies, religiously converting everything in sight. Each city was retaken in the blink of an eye, and pairs worldwide began to believe again. The Yellow Nation could do nothing to stop them. The pair planes were simply too many, and with one final ultimate move, each pair plane directed their projector beams towards each other, creating one huge holographic pair. All pairs who looked up and saw it were filled with hope, and the Banana Nation fell apart like the biscuity topping of a nice pear crumble. The world was saved. Fruitius had done it, but there was one more thing he needed to do to get closure. The engineers entered the workshop just as they had done in Fruitius' previous timeline. He was gonna do it this time. He wasn't gonna crash, and he was gonna take pairs to space. But as he took off, the same old problems came back to bite him in the arse. His arms were still too short. After all of this time, and to make it worse, his mittens meant he couldn't even press any of the buttons in his spaceship to try and rectify himself. Fruitius was panicking, but then came a phone call. It was Pairfesser Layton. You can do it, Fruitius. Just move your seat closer to the steering wheel. The Pairfesser was right. Fruitius thought back. They had come through so much together. He was so glad to have the Pairfesser as a sidekick. Fruitius moved his seat forward, and with one last monumental effort, he took control of the spaceship, engaged full upwards thrust, and finally entered outer space. And nowadays, when little pairs ask their parents for a bedtime story, they often speak about Fruitius the Brave. The fruit who took one small step for pears, and one giant leap for pear kind. <laughs>